Thank you very much for coming to the first visiting professorship program uh, this academic year. Um, we actually have a tremendous uh, lineup of visiting professors for the coming year. Uh, and we always start with a friend, someone who is a friend of Mount Sinai, and many of the doctors here know him well. Uh, and Dr. Fuster will introduce Dr. Granger in just a few minutes. Just to tell you um, the lineup of uh, great doctors who will be coming and gracing this panel in the coming months. Um, in October, Pamela Oyong from John Hopkins will be here. In November, Robert Bono from Northwestern in Chicago. In December, Dr. Schaff um, from Mayo Clinic. In January, Dr. Zogby from Houston Methodist. In February, we're um, going to have Francis Marklinski from University of Pennsylvania. In March, Robert Califf from Duke, formerly at the FDA as well. In April, Rick Nishimura from the Mayo Clinic. In May, we're very excited that we're going to have Dr. Braunwald and a one-on-one -on -one fireside panel discussion with Dr. Fuster talking about the future um, of cardiovascular disease from two legends in cardiology. And in June, Dr. Marty Leon from down the road at, at Columbia. Uh, today's topic is one of the most important probably in um, new topics for cardiologists. Uh, over the past year, uh, I get uh, probably an email a week from Dr. Mechanic asking when are we starting a cardiometabolic a fellowship program. Um, so maybe from today will be the beginning of that. Um, but it's one of the most important topics uh, that we have to become aware of in taking care of our patients. Uh, today's monograph is extraordinarily extensive and comprehensive and very well written. And I'm going to just introduce the panel that will come up uh, in just a few minutes. Um, Dr. Granger will be introduced formally by Dr. Fuster. Uh, Dr. Anwani Anilecki, who's um, professor and vice chair department of cardiovascular surgery and surgery di a surgical director of the heart transplantation and mechanical uh, circulatory support, Jeff Mechanic, professor of medicine and medical director of the Kravis Center for Cardiovascular Health. Um, and it's really quite a tribute that we have uh, a leading endocrinologist in the country who's part of the Department of Cardiology. Dr. Sharma, um, Ananda Lal Sharma, Professor of Medicine and Cardiology, President of Mount Sinai Heart, Director of Interventional Cardiology, who he himself actually, through his uh, foundation, uh, subsidizes our visiting professorship program. We thank him very much. Dr. Urubari, Professor of Medicine, Nephrology, Director uh, of Home Dialysis Program here at Mount Sinai. Thank you, Dr. Urubari. And last but certainly not least, uh, I want to introduce Ben Beer, who's going to give an overview of the topic for the day. Ben? I uh, just also want to mention Dr. Kovacic. I apologize for not having him on the program, uh, but he'll also be on the panel. Thank you. Uh, so I first like, would like to thank Dr. Fuster for moderating the session today, and for our visiting professor, Dr. Granger, for joining us here at Mount Sinai. In addition, I'd like to thank Dr. Goldman and my co-fellows for helping me prepare the review of the literature and reference for today's discussion. Diabetes affects over 400 million people globally as of 2014, a prevalence of 10% among the adult population. This has quadrupled in size from the estimated 100 million people in 1980. With the increase in age, obesity, and, and decrease in physical activity, the diabetic prevalence in our society is likely to continue to expand. Although diabetes has multiple comorbid conditions, neuropathy, retinopathy, nephropathy, et cetera, coronary artery disease is the primary driver of mortality in this population. Diabetes incurs a two-fold elevation in cardiovascular event risk, which is only rivaled by prior myocardial infarction. And not surprisingly, these patients have worse overall outcomes following acute coronary events than those without diabetes. In the following review, I will focus on the prevention, management, and evaluation of patients with diabetes and cardiovascular diseases. In addition to reviewing the management of evaluation of these patients, I will review the most current advancements in diabetic management of, for patients with comorbid cardiovascular outcomes. Over the last decade, there have been multiple developments and paradigm shifts in the treatment of patients with both conditions. 
For primary prevention, the efficacy of aspirin and other medications has been called into question for their routine use in patients with, with diabetes without known CVD. In contrast to the literature for on medications, new evidence is showing that uh, the potential benefits of metab metabolic surgery in patients with diabetes and obesity for the prevention of cardiovascular disease. In addition to prevention, strategies for intervention and revascularization in this population have been debated for decades, including the decision to pursue coronary artery bypass grafting versus percutaneous intervention. We will review the literature and the most current recommendations regarding this topic and discuss whether new stent and percutaneous interventional technologies can close the gap shown in the long-term follow-up of the Freedom Trial. Lastly, the improvement of cardiovascular outcomes in the trials of the SGLC2 inhibitors and the glucon-like peptide 1 receptor agonists has led a reorientation to diabetic therapy choices for patients with diabetes and cardiovascular disease. In addition, the DAPA-HF trial show that even for patients without diabetes, these agents can be potentially beneficial for patients with heart failure. One of the biggest questions for cardiologists over the next 10 years will be how our role in caring for this high-risk population will change. There is a growing call for cardiologists to be trained in cardiometabolic disease with emphasis on prevention, detection, and treatment of patients at risk for more aggressive treatment of patients with disease. As cardiologists, we, also we often take a primary responsibility in prescribing cholesterol-lowering and blood pressure-modifying medications for primary and secondary prevention of C uh, CVD. We also take action on evaluating our patients for these comorbid conditions. The abundance of recent diabetic data brings us to the nexus of the interplay of diabetes and cardiovascular disease. This is the tipping point from which we are now discovering that these diabetic medications can now even benefit our patients without a diagnosis of diabetes. In the past, cardiologists were reluctant to prescribe hypoglycemic agents and re relegated them to endocrinologists. Given the known benefit of these medications for our patients with diabetes and potential benefits in patients without diabetes, we need to become more comfortable in using these medications for our patients to improve their symptoms and extend their lives. Prior to prescribing these medications, we need to address the challenges of detection by checking A1C as a screening tool in high-risk patient populations, as we do with hypertension and hyperlipidemia. We should, in turn, be comfortable using a small subset of these medications that will improve our ability to accurately address the risk factor profiles of our patients, referring to specialists only when needed. Lastly, we need to address the importance of intervention in this high-risk population and know how and when to guide intervention based on the disease manifestation and clinical presentation. Thank you, and I look forward to our discussion. Very good. Benjamin, this is a tough topic to address, and I think you have done it very well. So let's see how you answer all the questions today. <laughs> OK. So it's a pleasure to, uh, for me to introduce uh, uh, Christopher Granger, who uh, has been here a couple of times before. And certainly, we are privileged to have him here today. Um, Chris was born in New York City, and he attended college at Middlebury in Vermont. And then he had um, he attended medical school at the University of Connecticut. From 1984 to 1988, he was uh, intern, intern resident and chief resident at the University of Colorado. And then it was in 1988 that uh, he moved to, uh, actually, to Duke, where he began his illustrious career, actually, as a fellow. He moved from fellow, associate professor, um, and professor. And at the present time, he's professor of medicine, department, professor of medicine at the Department of Medicine and director of the coronary care unit there at Duke. <clears throat> Duke has been characterized, by the way, in two fields that I feel are quite important. Uh, one is in the coronary care unit and all the trials that evolved from, and then the issue of electrophysiology and arrhythmias. This is really what made Duke really a very prominent institution, at least since I, I remember when I was a fellow, and certainly today. Well, let me say a few things about uh, Chris. Um, his CV, it weighs one kilogram and a half. 
So I have to summarize, but uh, it's worth it to make a few comments. First of all, he has been in the steering committee of actually 21 trials. This is quite unusual. And he has been the PI and the co-PI or the co-PI of a number of them. Then we, had, we can say that um, a number of awards, and the awards actually began when he was in college. They graduated cum laude from Middlebury College, a House of Staff Teaching Award at the University of Colorado, a number of awards at, uh, at Duke, uh, Excellence in Professionalism, uh, award from the School of Medicine at Duke University, and Clinical Research Forum, uh, top 10 clinical researchers research achievement awards in the United States in 2012. Out of the 10, he was one of them. And I can go on and on, but uh, just to point out that he's very well, he's very much uh, appreciated in the journals today. He's actually uh, in the editorial board of 10 journals. He <clears throat> is, has served and is serving important committees committees at the NIH and study sections, American Heart Association, and quite often he's part of the FDA in the assessment of uh, new drugs, assessment of trials, and so forth. His bibliography is quite impressive. Uh, he has more than 700 papers. And it's interesting, it's difficult to summarize because he has been so much of a contributor, and certainly, as I mentioned, in a large number of clinical trials. He was very interested from the very beginning on clinical pathophysiology and has a number of papers devoted to that. Uh, he has a number of papers devoted to the field of intervention and not necessarily focus on trials. And certainly he has other papers related to pharmacology. So uh, I tried to summarize a tremendous amount of information from somebody who is really the in the top of the cream of the cream in this country in terms of clinical investigation. So Chris, welcome to be here with us today. We are all very excited. And, uh, and let me give you the, uh, I hope it's different than the other two you have. Uh, so here it is uh, from our faculty to you uh, for outstanding teaching, wisdom and expertise as the and Andy Sharma, visiting professor, and the Simon Dag Memorial Lecture. You remember Simon, isn't it? I do, yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, anyway, this is for you. Thank Thanks you. Thanks very much. And I Thanks. really appreciate it. Yeah. 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 Let me take this to the picture. Yeah, yeah well, we do. Yeah. We can do it. <laughs> let, let, we are not in the right place. Okay. Let's, go. Let's move over there. Yeah. yeah. That's good. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm going to give you this. Yeah, thank you. You can sit here in the middle, I guess. Well, now comes the interesting moment to address one of the most complex fields in medicine, if I have to be truthful. One can be very superficial and talk about diabetes and hemoglobin A1C, but we have to go much further than this. So let me call now the experts in the field. I think you were, you named them before. Uh, we have Dr. Uh, Ani Sharma, Mechanic Jeff, and uh, Jaime Uribarri, and, and Jason. Good. Okay, you can, you can sit. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So I took I took this topic seriously and I'm not sure how it's going to move forward, but but I try to do it as complete as possible. And is and actually is evolving very rapidly. 
And I divided this in uh, eight different sections. And each section has three or four questions. The first one is issues that are of interest in diabetes today is an introduction. Then we'll go into the mechanisms, how really diabetes work. What, what aspects are at the molecular basis being affected? Because in order to understand pharmacology, we really have to understand that. Then we'll move into the treatment of what surrounds diabetes, which is hypertension, antiplatelet agents, statins, something that makes this disease to be less harmful if we take care of, that, of those aspects. And then we are going to move into the new pharmacology of diabetes. Uh, you know, we we'll start with metformin, not so new, and then go into the other drugs that you actually know. Then will be the question about, should we identify who has coronary artery disease in a patient who has diabetes, and what are the pros and cons? How do you address diabetes with an acute coronary syndrome? How do you address diabetes in patients with a stable coronary artery disease? And finally, what is new? Exciting few things that are coming up. So the program is somewhat ambitious, and, but let's see if we move. Obviously, the, the questions will be very short and the answers should be short too, otherwise it will be very difficult to go over each of the subjects. Let me start with an introduction of eight comments and Dr. Mechanic Jeff, I want to use to tell us which one of these comments is wrong, okay? No, you are wrong, you are wrong. You start already with the wrong foot. Now, 9% of the adults in this country have diabetes. Obesity accounts for 90% of the type two diabetes. Coronary heart disease, the incidence is significantly increased versus the non-diabetic patient. Uh, cardiovascular disease carries a risk that is, is twofold related to other aspects of coronary artery disease, that is if the patient has diabetes and the outcomes being significantly affected. Now, type two diabetes, type two diabetes has two components. One, insulin is not secreted appropriately and, and, and that that is secreted has insulin resistance in terms of the receptors. And I finish. Sodium glucose con trans transporter two inhibitors and glucagon-like peptide one receptor agonist is an exciting field. What about aspirin? Should we give aspirin in patients with diabetes? And then the issue of how you manage coronary artery disease with all the tools that we have today. So of these things that I mentioned, which is more or less a few things that we talk every day when we see patients with diabetes, is anyone that you feel uncomfortable with that perhaps is exaggerated? Um, the one comment you made about insulin secretion uh, you said that there was no insulin secretion? No, that is decreased the secretion, and, and what is secreted is resistance in the receptor. Right. So um, in, in type 2 diabetes, the general paradigm is the first hit. First, it's primary drivers with genetics, but really the first pathological hit is insulin resistance, and then you get a beta cell defect. So although there's decreased insul insulin production, it may still be at a high compensatory level, but just failing to fully compensate for the level of insulin resistance. Okay, let me, let me go and I go to you again. I will give you a rest afterwards, but I think it's important that we touch into the five steps, which at least is a way to address uh, how diabetes developed, okay? And, and basically, again, I mentioned, and then let's move forward first, most of the patients, or significant number of patients, are obese. And, and one of the problems is central obesity, where macrophages find this uh, fat there, try to remove the fat, but if it is too much, <coughs> these macrophages go into stage one of apoptosis and they release the substances that are really very, very important in the development of diabetes, which are the adipokines. Now, now going to step two. And the adipokine actually uh, causes the problem that we just mentioned, basically through a number of steps, leads to 
the insulin resistance. Okay, this is actually step number two. Step number three is fascinating. Obviously, glucose levels increase. And the question is, is glucose the toxic uh, uh, molecule? And actually, it's not. But the results from the high glucose are significant. Uh, the glucose gets into the mitochondria. Uh, oxidative stress then develops. And then the glucose that is free plus the oxidative stress actually lead to these HEEs or this increase in the HE formation, the end products, which is basically something that is wrong and is the way to take care of the excess of glucose in the blood. And then with this uh, problem of oxidation from the mitochondria, the end products as a result, and then some aspect, this also leads to inflammation. This is very toxic to the artery and really uh, leads to thrombogenicity, which is the final step. So that's basically uh, in summarizing, because when we talk about pharmacology, we really need to know what we are talking about. So what do you think? Yeah, yeah, sure. So the, the pharmacology for diabetes should be directed towards specific mechanisms, as you've outlined. And I think one would appreciate that this is really a networking process, that you have genetics affecting all the issues. You have adiposity directly affecting it. So for example, um, with the inflammation in adipose tissues, with the macrophages, uh, there's actually a macrophage infiltration of beta cells. And that's thought to be one of the paradigms where you have a decrease in beta cell reserve. Um, it, you also have effects of diabetes and dysglycemia. So the diabetes with microvascular disease and the insulin resistance with macrovascular disease. So it's not linear. Therefore, it's not gonna be just one drug. And the paradigm of pharmacology is gonna probably be a cocktail, a cocktail of different drugs hitting different uh, avenues. Yeah, we'll talk, we'll talk in a moment. Um, Jason, let me go into the issue, which is the third main topic, but is very important. In fact, what kills the patient and what leads to cardiovascular disease is what is around the diabetes. So we are in agreement that the diabetes in itself, and we discuss more or less simplistically the mechanism, but there is hypertension there. The adipokines can cause hypertension. Uh, there is, uh, can be hyperlipidemia with triglycerides also being involved. Uh, the issue of uh, thrombotic process that we also talk about. And I, li I like to touch in each of them. And, uh, and at least, again, uh, rather than establishing a debate, I tell you what I know about it, and then you can just elaborate. So first of all, let's address the issue of lipids, which is interesting. So let's assume the patient has diabetes and actually um, has hypercholesterolemia. Uh, what basically say, the literature says that this patient should be treated with the statins if the risk factor profile is not very significant. That is, diabetes alone calls for statins. That's number one. Diabetes with risk factors associated with calls for a more aggressive approach, and that is statins plus statin and acetamiv in some cases. And finally, and this is interesting, diabetes with coronary artery disease, that is we are already dealing for secondary prevention, let's say, it calls for the most aggressive approach, including actually the PCSK9 inhibitors. I'm just saying this because it's interesting. This just came in the guidelines that were released in 2018, and that is whatever it is, diabetes means you have to give statins. And then the different approaches. I'd like you to comment on before we move into the other aspects of how to treat it. I mean, I think the PCSK9 inhibitor trials have been incredibly informative because they've really shown us that there's no lower uh, sort of a J effect where we get LDL and triglycerides to a certain point and bad things start to happen. So I think beyond just PCSK9 inhibitors, that's informed us that we can generally be across the board more aggressive as you've indicated with intensive statin therapy and azetamide 
I think there are some interesting you know, scientific unresolved issues, such as the issue of do statins actually uh, drive diabetes to some extent, and do they make a small proportion of pre-diabetic patients diabetic? And that's probably certainly the case. Um, and the mechanisms of that aren't well understood, but that shouldn't uh, hold us back from using aggressive statin therapy because overwhelmingly the, the data shows that they save lives in these populations. Okay, thank you. Uh, Jaime, you are close to the kidney, and the kidney is close to the heart, so... <laughs> That's what I said. all right? So let's talk for a moment about hypertension and see, see what you think. You know, at the moment we, we deal with diabetes, we begin to deal with the kidney, and the fact of the matter is hypertension is one of the problems, maybe as a result of the diabetes, as we mentioned, the adipokines. And it is interesting the, the, what has happened in the last six years, and I just mentioned for the discussion, the first, first of all meant diabetes and hypertension means the renin angiotensin aldosterone system has to be approached with ACE inhibitors or receptor blockers. So that's to start with, hypertension and diabetes. Then a number of trials came up and says, well, there are other drugs that may be appropriate. And in fact, it ended up that even calcium blockers may be of interest. But my question is about the famous SPRINT trial. You know, the SPRINT trial suggested that patients with hypertension, we should aim at a blood pressure systolic of less than 120. And unfortunately, I have seen patients with diabetes that are absolutely treated in this way, when in fact diabetics were not part of the SPRINT trial. And what I, th what I think is basically happened is why they were not part of the SPRINT trial is because if you drop the blood pressure too much in a diabetic patient who has microvascular disease, you may hypoperfuse vital organs. So now the, the final statement is you should drop the blood pressure perhaps below 130 over 80, and it still is a perhaps. I'd like to know what is your opinion. You know, over time, things have changed. When I grew up being a fellow, Brenner from Boston yeah. had a very predominant theory at the time, which was the single nephron, uh, and essentially that um, there is, if there is glomerular hypertension, that is going to cause the progressive kidney damage. And for more than a decade, that was the predominant effect. So therefore, our idea for many years was actually hypercorrect hypertension. So had you asked me 20 years ago, I would have gone 110 or even less as long as the patient was asymptomatic and tolerating that well. But obviously there is more information right now on the Brenner hypothesis. Doesn't seem to have necessarily, it's not necessarily wrong, but not so straightforward. So now we have a moderation. So in general terms, we use the number 120, although we don't have any specific basis on any trial. Of interest in terms of hypertension and diabetes is the fact that we do not think too much, but early in diabetes, before there is any evidence of so-called kidney disease, albuminuria, um, impairment of creatinine, you tend to be hypertensive. And one of the postulations, one of the things that come to mind is, as you know, the SGLT2 transporters in the proximal nephron. Yeah, we'll talk in a moment about yes. it. Yes that carry by, by, I mean, reabsorbing more glucose, they're also reabsorbing more sodium, and that is most likely at the end uh, a significant mechanism of hypertension and diabetes, just volume expansion related to Okay, that. thank you, but at least we should be cautious. And that's that's the that point. Okay, Benjamin, uh, you know, we said that a large majority of patients who have diabetes type two are overweight or are obese. So do you know the figures of what, when we try to decrease obesity by sending people to, to a dietitian, or even we tell people what to do? So I think the uh, non-invasive approaches to losing weight are, have limited efficacy. I don't know exactly the numbers on them, but I think that there's a benefit in using a community-based approach. I think Weight Watchers has decent outcomes, but otherwise a single person trying to do it on their own has very poor outcomes. The effects with metabolic surgery, however, do seem to have a very large benefit in this population. And I think there's been some debate in the medical literature some time about the most appropriate way to address those patients. 
Dr. Mechanic, um, I, I, I have the figures here. If we talk about sustainability, that is, you can lose weight for the next three months, but sustainability at one year uh, is actually only in about 15% of people with diabetes and being overweight. So, and this is, a, to me, is a huge paradox because we know, and that's why we went into the mechanisms, that, that obesity is one of the key issues by which the whole diabetic process is being developed. So, how do you react to that? So, adipos adiposity is a driver for dysglycemia. To the extent that you believe it's playing a role, you have to determine how much weight someone needs to lose to get the salutary effect on whether it's uh, the diabetes or whether it's sleep apnea or whether it's fatty liver. In general, lifestyle medicine will uh, decrease a median of about 5 to 7 percent. We know that from Look Ahead and uh, DPP, et cetera. If you need more than that, then you need pharmacotherapy uh, for weight. Um, and also, you have to determine what other complications you're targeting. If you need sleep, if you're targeting sleep apnea, you need 10% loss. If you're targeting uh, NAFLD NASH, you need 15 to 20, maybe even more uh, percent loss. I like to get into now. You are this is your debut. You know, when there is a soccer game, Messi they bring him at the moment of big trouble, <laughs> uh, and that is in the second part. So now is the moment that I want to start asking some questions to you, but I think you have a question or a comment first. Yeah, it's just because it's so important, right? And, and I think there's a couple of questions I would have for Jeff and a couple of observations. One, we talked about this earlier, the, the um, diabetes prevention program. One of the most important trials, I think, in the last 20 years, that one can cut in half the likelihood of developing full diabetes in pre-diabetics with simply walking. The main intervention was walking 30 minutes a day, five days a week simple. Almost everybody can do, and the vast majority of our patients can do that. And there wasn't a lot of weight loss. So my question is, is there something beneficial from muscle blood flow independent from weight loss for metabolic control? So um, muscle takes up uh, glucose. And in fact, one of the reasons why we address sarcopenia with strength training, and we do this at 85th Street, uh, is in, in, from a pragmatic standpoint is, is strength training, is you get these non-insulin uh, dependent mechanisms of, of glucose uptake, and you decrease insulin resistance by building up muscle mass and with strength training. So physical activity is, is both the aerobic cardiovascular fitness component, but it's also the strength training metabolic component of, of building up muscle mass. And there was probably these pleiotrophic effects of physical activity that, that were seen in DPP. And then the other two, the other two observations, one is that in, and maybe we'll get back to this, in gastric bypass surgery, from what I understand, the benefits um, are almost immediate before there's any weight loss. There's already, because of the, presumably the effect on the incretins um, secreted by the bowel, there's already benefit, even before weight loss, which I think is, uh, is remarkable. And finally, um, it'll be really interesting to see, like this trial called SELECT, that's a trial of um, semaglutide for weight loss in patients with cardiovascular disease It'll be, it'll be interesting to see if there might be some approaches that both result in weight loss and at the same time have other effects to improve diabetic status. Okay, let, let's move uh, for a moment into the most recent information on bariatric surgery because actually it's quite spectacular. And let me begin with the studies published in two, 2017, the Stampede studies from Cleveland Clinic. And basically, they started with very few patients, 150, and what they observed, these were patients with diabetes in a BMI between 27 and 43. And the first thing that they observed is that the hemoglobin um, A1C uh, was significantly decreasing about one-third of these people and not in the control group. I would like to ask, by the way, at this moment, uh, Jeff, is the hemoglobin A1C something that we should be obsessed about it? Right now, we have no choice but to be obsessed about it. But um, our prediction as endocrinologists is that continuous glucose monitoring and sensor technology uh, 
will eventually supplant uh, our reliance on A1C. Okay, so what they found at five years of follow-up, follow aside of the, what they mentioned, hemoglobin A1C, that actually the BMI average uh, decreased by 10 points. This is extremely important because in 75% of these people, this was sustainable at five years. So the question that is really, I mean, is quite exciting to me is that this type of surgery uh, really uh, not only modify hemoglobin A1C, and by the way, glucose levels in blood, but at the same time had a tremendous impact on the weight of the patients. And, and this leads to the final, and I'd like you to comment on this, um, uh, uh, Chris, the final study was presented just two weeks ago in the European Society meeting uh, on the type 2 diabetes uh, by the group uh, at the Cleveland Clinic, and that is very exciting. Uh, they were talking here about um, actually 2,000 patients in which uh, all had diabetes in a high BMI. And, and you know, it, it was not a randomized study, but it was an observational study. But what was quite striking is the decrease in cardiovascular events in the group that had this kind of uh, bariatric surgery compared with those that were treated medically. You know, you go from 48% events at five years, at eight years, I'm sorry, in the treated group medically versus 30% in the other. But what was most striking was actually mortality, which was 18% at eight years in the group treated with bariatric surgery versus 10% in the group treated uh, with medical therapy. So I'd like you to react to this and see what you think. Yeah, I agree. I think it was, um, it was really impressive. As you point out, it is fundamentally an observational study. So I think we also... Um, uh, really need to have randomized data to better understand with a proper control group. But that study, and then there was another study also presented at the European Society from England that was quite similar, quite comparable, actually, in terms of the results. It didn't have hemoglobin A1C, but with the most careful adjustment that they could do, they showed a, a similar effect in a broader um, set of centers in the United Kingdom with, with lower mortality associated with the um, improvements sustained improvements in um, body weight in the population that had bariatric surgery. And the other thing I think that's really important about bariatric surgery, compared to even 10 or 20 years ago, the, the, um, the, the surgical complications, and, and also perhaps the availability now of these sleeves that can be, um, uh, that can be deployed endo, um, with endoscopic um, procedures, uh, make it, I think, a much more t better tolerated procedure. Yeah, the, actually, we have the figures. The, the early uh, morbidity and mortality, that is, in the, in the first 30 days, is actually less than 7%. That's, these are the figures. In a longer term, that is, when they follow these patients for eight years, you know, there were aspects. Uh, they were for uh, bleeding requiring transfusion in 3% for whatever reason. Uh, cardiac events, 1%. Renal failure requiring dialysis, 0.5%. Uh, 48% abdominal surgical intervention required. And endoscopic requirement, 16%. So it's not free of, of some problems, but at least overall, the results are so spectacular that really we, begin to, we have to begin to question ourselves if we should not begin to address this issue perhaps uh, much more vigorously. Um, I'd like to ask, um, Dr. Sharma is very quiet thus far. So, well, yeah, you are. This thing will help me in discussion further. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I wait for a few minutes. <laughs> yeah. So I think the, the question that I'd like to address at this moment is who is the ideal candidate for bariatric surgery? And actually the guidelines from Europe and the United States just came out, so I can, I can just relate to. Well, first of all, if the patient has class one obesity, and I believe it's a VMI between 30 and 35, 
between 35 and 40 is, is, uh, is two, is class two, and more than 40 is class three obesity. So if a patient is class one obese, between 30 and 35 BMI, and the glycemia cannot be controlled, poorly controlled, this patient can be considered for metabolic surgery, which is the way we should be talking about. The same in class two, with glycemic control not being adequate, also should be considered for operation, unless there are other morbidities that prevent that. And certainly, obesity without diabetes certainly is a must if it is class three, that is, with more than 40. So um, what do you people think? Benjamin, what do you think about this? Is this, is this the way you think when you see an obese person or overweight with uh, diabetes? It certainly was not the way I thought four or five years ago. I think taking care of patients with complications in the hospital definitely deterred my practice. However, the more the data comes out, the more obesity becomes highly prevalent and the more difficult it is to manage these patients without surgery, it's certainly something I'm beginning to think about more. However, I still think it takes a, a motivated patient to have a successful surgery and they have to be able to continue the dietary changes that go with it and to be able to participate in an exercise program as well. Thank you. Chris, uh, there's another aspect. We talk about um, hyperlipidemia. Um, we talk about uh, the issue of hypertension. We talk about obesity. What about antithrombotic therapy? This was also part of the... And, and, and again, as I read the literature, uh, today to give aspirin to a patient with diabetes is not recommended, with the exception if the patient has a cardiovascular risk factor profile, then it should be considered. And if the patient has coronary artery disease, here is where you begin to move into even not only aspirin, but aspirin and something else. Before we go into this something else, uh, are you surprised that a diabetic patient with so much coronary disease and so forth, the trials so far have been negative, the Japanese trial, the ASCEND trial, and so forth. Are you surprised? I think it was really surprising. It was very surprising to me that there was really such a, um, a lack of benefit, especially in ASCEND, which is a pretty robust um, trial done by the Oxford group. Uh, and um, uh, I, uh, so, so yes, I, but your point, I think that what we can all agree is that once a patient has vascular disease and diabetes, then um, then being on uh, aspirin is um, is very important, and um, and maybe maybe even more. Yeah, here's the the two studies presented last week again in Europe, uh, and that is patients with a stable coronary disease, no previous stroke or myocardial infarction and the patients were stable with diabetes. And this is where people begin to hit hard when there is coronary artery disease. And this was the use of ticagrelor plus aspirin versus aspirin alone. And as you recall, uh, ticagrelor was a winner for very little margin in terms of MACE. 7% uh, events, ticagrelor plus aspirin versus almost 9% aspirin alone in terms of events. Uh, over a period of follow-up of three years. But the issue of bleeding, 2% aspirin by tricagular versus 1% aspirin alone, uh, it puts things a little bit in the, in the caution stage. But when they did the appropriate statistics, it seems that overall, if the patient doesn't have uh, tendency to bleed or a history of bleeding, this is something that we should begin to consider in the diabetic patients with a stable coronary artery disease. And I'd like to hear also what you have to say. Yeah, I thought, I mean, I thought Themis was um, actually relatively unimpressive. I mean, there were benefits, but they seemed yeah. to be very much very balanced close. By the, for the average patient by the bleeding risk, the cost, um, uh, no difference in mortality. So I, I um, but I think your summary is good, that, that, that if it's a person at low bleeding risk and higher thrombotic risk, it's a reasonable thing to consider. Okay, do you think, and you mentioned this this morning, um, now in chronic coronary artery disease, regardless of diabetes, rivaroxaban is coming pretty aggressively, uh, even alone after a year of stabilization. Do you think that the diabetic patient, uh, rather than ticagrelor, uh, 
plus aspirin versus aspirin alone, which was not very impressive. Maybe when we start talking with the new oral anticoagulants, we may have a way to go there. I, I think it's an area that it'll be interesting to get to, to have more studies. Um, the COMPASS trial, of course, the, the, the population that really seemed to have benefit was the peripheral arterial disease population, not specifically um, patients with diabetes. Um, but, um, but, but, but I think more extensive vascular disease that frequently occurs with diabetes is a, is a group that, may, um, uh, that might well benefit from um, low dose of a, of a um, non-vitamin K oral anticoagulant, including you know, there's, there is excitement about the development of factor 11A inhibitors that might, that, that, are, that, are, that are hypothesized, let's say, to have even lower bleeding risk and still antithrombotic benefit. And, and so that might be an area on um, patients with diabetes and more advanced vascular disease that would, uh, where there would be greater benefit than risk. But we'll have to see. So we are getting more and more aggressive as the disease is more apparent. Now, let's move now into what I consider is a lot of excitement, actually. And let's begin by, let me see, Jeff. I have a patient comes to me today with diabetes. I don't, no coronary artery disease as far as I can know. And, and he comes with a hemoglobin A1C of seven or eight or nine. And the question is how I start. And I learned recently that I start with metformin regardless. Is this okay? It's okay. Um, it'll change. So one of the major efforts right now in uh, diabetes algorithms is where does metformin fit? Uh, it's the safest and it's still the least expensive, so it still occupies that, that position of, of first drug. And the main controversies now are what's the best first to add. But I'll tell you that uh, we're very, very close in writing our algorithms, looking at the evidence. And particularly now with changing trends of pharmacy benefit uh, managers uh, now uh, paying for some of these other agents, that it is certainly not unreasonable to start with an SGLT2 or a GLP-1 receptor agonist, uh, maybe even a DPP-4 uh, inhibitor, although we're using them uh, less and less, instead of metformin. A lot of patients still can't tolerate metformin. Except the guidelines would not agree with you. And I don't mean the guidelines are the gospel. What I'm saying is that they really feel pretty strong, except one problem, and maybe Dr. Rivari can comment on, uh, patients with uh, kidney dysfunction, or even patients with heart failure, or even patients with GI intolerance is a problem, isn't it? Yeah, the main limitation in the metformin, if you follow the FDA requirement, is the impaired kidney function. Although, over the years, we have become more and more accepting of what is uh, the limits in terms of 30 or 40 ml per minute of uh, glomerular filtration, whether to decide not to use metformin. In my mind, from what I have reviewed the literature, the evidence in favor of metformin is so overwhelming, not only in terms of diabetes, yeah. but in health in general, that it's a drug that I think is just fantastic. Uh, but the main limitation is with advanced chronic kidney disease, you cannot use it, although there are some isolated trials, small trials suggesting that is not a major problem. It seems to me, Jeff, that metformin is the only drug before the new ones that we are going to talk about it that decrease some mortalities, indeed, or measure cardiovascular events of all the others, the sulfonylureas and all of that. No, not, not really for the, the cardiovascular events, the uh, weight of evidence is not uh, substantial for metformin. Uh, the evidence for metformin and cardiovascular events is primarily uh, post hoc and meta analysis. We really don't have these strong perspectives. Was not the UK a study that, that really shows some decrease in cardiovascular events? Yeah. If I recall, um, that I, was, I, was, I, a I, was a main breakthrough. This is the one we were just looking at. We were just discussing it. But still, the weight of evidence yeah. is not what you would think by virtue of how prevalent. Uh, metformin use is. Uh, and again, for right now, metformin should be your first line therapy. I'm only indicating that the trend is in the future, it may start falling out of that first line okay. Uh, role. Okay, let's concentrate now on the, these exciting drugs. And, and let's begin with the SGLT2 inhibitors, um, which 
basically, at least in a very primitive way, uh, started to get into the literature because they excrete glucose from the kidney and then a nitrouretic drug because it's neutralizing the receptor of the absorption by the tubules of the glucose and, and sodium. And then it was thought that this would drop blood pressure and hemodynamically would make the heart that is in trouble to work better. Uh, and it seems that everything that we were say, saying about three years ago is wrong. Uh, but at least I would like to ask uh, an opinion first, uh, you, Dr. Uribarri, about how, how do you think this drug works? And maybe I will also ask you, uh, Jeff, and even Juan Badimon, if it is here, because they have done very fascinating work on the uh, heart failure. So tell us how this was. The, first of all, is a drug that is good for the kidney. And th this is why I'm yeah, asking you. It has, been, it has been shown by now that it's good for the kidneys. Uh, the glucose, there is a problem with the glucose reabsorption, and it's not that only the main mechanism. The main mechanism is that having less glucose going into the interstitial of the tubule, which is a complicated issue, reduces the overall absorption. So it's much more than just the blockade of one-to-one -one transport of glucose versus sodium. It's much more than that. So the effect is very striking in terms of diminution of overall volume, uh, a decreased volume reabsorption by the proximal nephron. Are you saying, I want to understand, are you saying that an increase in sodium absorption and glucose affects the kidney? I'm just asking. I'm sorry? I am asking the question whether, to look at the other things the other way, do you think that an increase in sodium reabsorption and an increase in glucose reabsorption damages the kidney? Yes. I mean, there is plenty of evidence that when the yeah. tubules go into the renal tubular cell, initiate a cascade of phenomena, some of which you described earlier, yeah. that will lead to actual damage there, not to say the overall systemic effect of sodium retention and glucose retention in the body overall. Yeah. Jason, were you surprised about the main effect is in heart failure? I mean, when you really go in looking the most recent data, mm -hmm not only prevents the progression of the disease, but hospitalization uh, and even mortality related to heart failure. What, what is your view about it? No, exactly. Chris and I were talking about this just earlier. And I think it's still, uh, definitely there's animal studies showing that SGL2 inhibitors can actually decrease myocardial interstitial fibrosis. Whether that carries through into humans with HEF-PEF remains to be seen, but certainly in HEF-REF, the data are very impressive. But it's still, to me, a little unclear, I think, in our discussions, uh, whether that's just purely a heart failure effect or whether there's actually regression of fibrosis in the heart. I think further studies will be needed to really flesh that out in, in the human. Uh, Juan Badimon is here. Oh, he's not. OK, well, basically, they just published a very interesting work done experimentally. Uh, is Carlos here either? No, he's not. Well, they, basically what they have found is that it significantly affects the energy, ATP energy, enhancing the effectiveness of the ATP. And it's very well known in the peak model. It is fascinating. And they have the data of an improvement contractility and so forth just in the peak. And there's other data that is coming now in the literature in that regard. So um, here is my surprise, Jeff, and that is, when you look at all the studies done with this type of drugs, the SGLT2 inhibitors, in fact, they were positive in patients who had high risk, coronary, high risk factors for coronary artery disease, but not necessarily coronary artery disease. When the guidelines today say you only use them if there is significant coronary artery disease, when the trials were showing that they were positive even at high risk, so what do you think? Well, there are effects on MACE, but there are the, the effects on heart failure. But these drugs are pleiotrophic. Uh, one of the things that we observed was that the weight loss that was observed with the SGLT2s was disproportionately more than what you would expect from the renal stoichiometry of uh, sodium and uh, uh, glucose uh, loss. In addition, there are now emerging data looking at SGLT2 effects on blood cells on erythrocytes and uh, on, on uh, hematocrit and on the bone marrow, uh, on the brain and appetite centers. 
So these are really pervasive systemic effects of the SGLT2s that we're still learning more and more about. And that's why there are surprises that transcend just that linear approach on, on the heart, on heart failure versus uh, accelerated atherosclerosis. Well, allow sure. me just one thing in terms of, you also lose glucose, which is calories, isn't right. it? No, but so weight loss is more. Why people are yeah. not using it to lose weight. No, but, the, <laughs> but the point is that the weight loss is more than what you would expect from the amount of glucose lost in the urine. Stoichiometrically, it exceeds it. So there's an effect that the SGLT2s are having on intermediary metabolism and on the brain and appetite centers. Well, first of all, let's move into the second group. This group is nice because you can give it orally. Now let's talk about the second group, the GLP-1 um, receptor agonist. Can you tell me, because this is a completely different effect, tell me about glucagon. What in the world glucagon is doing with all of this? Yes, you. Because uh, we have to understand that pathway in order to, to know so what we So as a counter-regulatory hormone, it, it's thought that the GLP-1 receptor agonists are exerting the primary role in, in suppressing glucagon. And um, glucagon now is emerging as one of the the major targets of interest for drug development in uh, type 2 diabetes. Uh, so it's, it's a very important target, but bear in mind the GLP-1 receptor agonists also uh, affect appetite centers crossing the blood-brain barrier. It's the ileal break, so when you eat and the chyme makes it to the, the, the K and L cells in the distal ileum, it, it sends an endogenous message, the GLP-1, and it decreases yeah, but, gastric but you didn't motility. answer the question. What glucagon does? I mean, you're suppressing glucagon, I suspect, because you, makes you compete with the receptor yeah. of glucagon. That's what basically the GLP is stimulating glucagon. What happened with glucagon? What glucagon, why is it so bad for your health in diabetes? It makes the sugar go up. It's a counter-regulatory well, well, hormone. Teleologically, why? I mean, why do but we But the have sugar it? going up by itself, well, anyway, I don't want to discuss this, but I would like to know more about it. Well, but I, th I think you're getting at a very good point, which is, you know, what's the whole purpose of treating diabetes? Do you treat diabetes because you're treating a sugar? Is this a glucocentric disease and, and therapeutic uh, strategy, or are you treating really a different type of disease that's more than just sugar? Are you treating an inflammatory disease, a disease of abnormal adiposity, of of uh, cardiometabolic phenomenon. And if that's the question, then the answer is there, there probably are pleiotropic effects of glucagon beyond just making the sugar go up. Because you're right, it doesn't make sense. If it's just affecting the sugar, why should it uh, play such a central role? Well, anyway, these drugs, I don't know, everybody talks about it, but there are problems, uh, you know, with, they don't do anything with heart failure, maybe make the heart failure worse you have to inject the drug, so why we are so into it? Well, the new one, there, there, semaglutide, there's gonna be an oral semaglutide, Pioneer 6, so it will be available as an oral agent. Okay, but it's uh, not now yet. But, but not right now. Um, they're injectables, but it's the weight issue. There you see really good, not only do you see glycemic control, but you see very nice effects on weight, and high dose Lyra, liraglutide, um, is an FDA-approved drug for long-term weight loss. Okay, so let me summarize then what is coming out on the recent guidelines just three, four months ago. And that is that they're very much focused on the SGLT2 inhibitors, the ones that we mentioned at the beginning. And that is, if you have a patient with diabetes and multiple risk factors, but not necessarily with cardiovascular disease, you may have a significant impact in heart failure, but not in cardiovascular events, okay? On the other hand, if you have a patient with cardiovascular disease and you give these drugs, you can really have not only decrease in events, but you also had a decrease in mortality. And I think that's interesting because what I'm surprised about the guidelines is because all the trials on this SGLT2 were not necessarily in people with coronary disease. In fact, were in people who had a high risk of coronary disease. But this is one issue. And the other issue is that what do we do today when we have a patient 
with diabetes, and we started with metformin with the pluses and minuses. And if the patient, according to guidelines, has um, high risk of coronary artery disease, you are still conservative, but if the patient has coronary artery disease or cardiovascular disease, then you add one of these drugs. So it's a little bit paradoxical because the data is much more significant. But what I want to talk about it to me is the probably one of the three most important studies of this year, if I, if I, if I may. And this is the study with one of these drugs in patients who did not have diabetes and had just heart failure alone. And this is the study, um, Jason, that was published by the group in Ireland, but is a multi-center study, the DAPA-HF trial, in which actually uh, the patients, a significant number of patients, I think they were close to 5,000, were randomized uh, in, uh, in dapagliflozin, which is the first drug that really came into the discussion of this subject, and versus placebo. And these patients had heart failure, but about 40% actually had diabetes and 60% did not. And what is fascinating is the data is quite striking. Uh, just a decrease in mortality by 26% and in cardiovascular events by 18%. And in any way you look at the data is absolutely surprising. So it seemed to me that as we get into the heart failure business, now we have something coming up absolutely surprising. And I'd like to hear from you, Jason. Yeah, I think the data was extremely exciting. I think um, about two thirds of the population were ischemic and about one third was uh, non-ischemic. Um, uh, and I think it really begets the question of whether there is a direct antifibrotic effect or some other direct you know, cardiac effect, which where the beneficial where the benefits come from beyond and above uh, effects on uh, fluid uh, removal, which, as we know, is, is really doesn't do much to impact mortality. So I think it's extremely provocative, and I'm sure it's going to beget a lot more studies, including immediately, I think, in a hef pef population where we can see if the, any cardiac beneficial effects can translate, antifibrotic effects can translate into improved outcomes, because as we know, that's an, an area of particular need in cardiology at the moment. Yeah, Dr. Penny, are you here? I think I saw you. Are you giving these drugs already in heart failure or are considering them? Okay, thank you. Well, now we have to wake up Annie and Dr. Sharma. <laughs> because we are going to enter into how do you manage acute coronary syndromes in a diabetic patient? How do you manage a patient with a stable coronary artery disease? And I'd like to start with uh, maybe you, Samin. Uh, in, in patients with acute coronary syndrome, we have a number of questions antiplatelet therapy, medical management, what do you give, uh, cabbage, PCI, the management of glucose, are you aggressive there, are you not? And the first thing I want to ask you is about antiplatelet therapy. And let me, and let me again to present if you agree or disagree. The patient has a non stemi okay, and he's a diabetic patient. And if you are not going to intervene, you are giving aspirin plus clopidogrel. And if you're going to intervene, you give aspirin plus pasugrel or ticagrelor. Are you in agreement? Well, um, if you see the, in the PLATO trial, about 30-plus uh, uh, percent of patients was medical therapy. So it means they did not go to the cath lab. And there, the benefit was not in the pressugrel trials, so all involved PCI. But uh, for the ticagrelor trial, also involved the medical therapy, and benefit was there even in the medical therapy. So patient, if we are managing non-STEMI without PCI, will be aspirin and ticagrelor or clopidogrel. Of course, there is some issues with the side effects, and so it's different, but otherwise, 
uh, will give aspirin plus ticagrelor or even in patients medically managed non stem if the patient has a STEMI, obviously, you're going to intervene and you're going to use Ticagrel or, or Prasugrel. Yes. Is that right, plus aspirin? You agree with that? Okay. Now, the next question, uh, medical management, we talk about ACE inhibition, and if the patient has low ejection fraction following a STEMI, of course, you, you might consider aldosterone blockade. But I'd like to ask uh, Annie about uh, cabbage versus PCI in a diabetic patient with acute coronary syndrome. And I present to you two patients, though. One is non-STEMI, comes in, and you want to do something because you consider he's a high-risk patient, and the other is a STEMI patient. How do you view cabbage in these two different situations? I think the, the starting point is that bypass surgery is better than PCI. So that's where you're starting. And there's lots of indirect data, but the most direct data will be the data from the Freedom Study. But there are some caveats to that. I, I think the first caveat is there's no benefit of bypass surgery over PCI for at least the first two to three years. It's about somewhere between two to three years where the curves start to separate. And that's more important for your second case, which is a STEMI, where you're trying to save life. So life-saving intervention for the day, you know, the day of the myocardial infarction is more important than two years later. The second caveat is that if you look at the operative mortality in the Freedom Study, it's somewhere just about, we'll just round it down to 1%. So you have to assume that to get that benefit that's going to come about two, two to three years later, you're going to have 1% mortality. The higher your operative mortality, then the longer it will take to get benefit of surgery over PCI. Going back to your STEMI case, if you have a STEMI and you operate within a week of the STEMI, there's a markedly, market increase in operative mortality. So again, you're going to take longer to get your benefit of surgery. The, thir the third thing would be ventricular function. We saw that from the, the um, subgroup analyses. The more ventricular dysfunction you have, the longer it will take, the, the less benefit you'll get with surgery. And then the fourth thing I think it's worth mentioning is left main disease. That wasn't studied in, in, in the Freedom Study. And indirect uh, data from like the Excel trial suggests that if there is benefit of surgery over PCI in left main disease, it's gonna be very small. So I think when you put all these together, in general, if you have a non-ST elevation myocardial infarction, I think it's reasonable to move towards uh, a surgery rather than a PCI. But with an ST elevation myocardial infarction, I think saving the patient's life and revascularizing, revascularizing the patient ASAP takes precedence over gains that might take three years to come. I don't, I don't know if I made any sense. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Samin, the last week, the guidelines came out from the European Society of Cardiology, and the way they managed this, in a way, is what he said with some differences. Well, if you have a STEMI, you really open the artery. You don't fool around with bypasses and anything. If you have a non-STEMI, there are two kinds. One is the acute one, and that is that you have to act in the first 24 hours or 48 hours. And the other is the one that you feel cool and you wait. On the second one, they tend to advise uh, the, the cabbage on the second group, particularly this multi-vessel disease. On the first group, if you have to act very quickly, uh, PCI versus cabbage, there's no answer. And uh, this is actually in the guidelines. I'd like you to comment on that. Yeah. So no, I think, uh, so basically now, just like uh, acute coronary syndrome, we're calling it a chronic coronary syndrome. So acute coronary syndrome. So I think STEMI, everybody understands that that is PCI, very rarely those patients go for coronary artery bypass surgery. Uh, and even if patients are in shock and so. So question comes is in the non-STEMI and it's not evolving, uh, a patient has cooled down and now what, what are the predictors? What do you decide? When you decide uh, and what approach? So clearly that if uh, acute episode has been taken care, sometime maybe by culprit vessel PCI or just by medical management, then it depends on the various factors, of course, diabetes is one of them, and the extent of coronary artery disease. It turns out to be, it is the extent of coronary artery disease is a big predictor of a long-term survival benefit or recurrent MI between cabbage versus PCI. More complex the disease, 
better is the benefit of cabbage. And turns out to be the big trial syntax, where the real benefit occurred was in the three vessel disease. In the left main, even five years and now 10 years were identical. They actually, if you're low syntax score, which is the degree of all the blockage we put together and to give the number, in the syntax score of 32 and below, actually PCI was better than cabbage in the left main, and that was the basis of the Excel trial. Yeah. And we actually, this week here, the five year data, as Ani pointed out, different sectors after three years. So three years, no, every time, where you take a berry trial and freedom trial, any trial, syntax original after three years. So we know, now we will know this week that after five years in the Excel trial, which is the trial of left main, with the moderate syntax score means less than 32, is there a difference between PCI versus cabbage? And of course, 30 plus percent were diabetic patient, and stay tuned. Okay, so let me ask you, because the data is available, and also to both of you, uh, the patient has three vessel disease, uh, and I'm talking about the syntax trial, uh, eight years of follow-up, eight and a half years of follow-up. The patient has uh, three vessel disease, and here's my question. Should this patient had cabbage or PCI, eight years follow-up, and, uh, and is this affecting mortality in addition to MACE? Ani? I am asking you the question. You have a patient with three vessel disease, is not diabetic, and based on the study that just was published on the syntax, eight years of follow-up, what would you do with this patient? I will tell you what syntax says, but I'm asking you the question. Would you consider bypass or you would consider uh, PCI? So for a non-diabetic patient? Yep. How old is the patient? I don't care. The patient well, can be age 40 or the patient can be age 65 or 70. I mean, 65 or 70, definitely PCI because it's unlikely you're going to get a survival benefit. So your benefit is going to be freedom from, from MACE or improvement in quality of life. In a 45-year-old, I think if you're going to get arterial grafts, then I would go for surgery. Okay, the data is the average age of the patients was 71 on the syntax. And the follow-up was eight years, and, uh, and they affected mortality with cabbage. This just was published. Yeah, about so, I mean, that was the syntax of the same trial. They went up to 10 years, average time was 8.5, yeah. and showed that mortality benefit, if you take overall, and within that group, it was a three-vessel disease, which benefited three cabbage. Three-vessel the only. Yeah. Only, not the, so yeah. question okay. always, we had an interventionist, and that is where all the editorials of all these studies even freedom on or the syntaxes is that what was done in both these trials were the different stents and since the all the yeah. better treatment of the diabetic which we have spoken today none of those drugs were used additional antiplatelet therapy anticoagulants were not used which have been shown benefit yeah. so what will be the real the true story at this time i say very simple based on the data you have to follow tell the patient these are the data, and out of the cath lab, you have to say, and we also know, and we follow that very closely, that half of the patient, despite knowing this, that five years, there is a mortality benefit, with the full disclosure of benefit of cabbage versus PCI, they opt for PCI. Yeah, thank you. Now I have uh, four new developments, just to finish, and all go to you, uh, Chris, see what you think. The first one, and I believe is questionable, is what do you use in patients undergoing cabbage? Would you use aspirin alone? Or do you use aspirin and ticagrelor? Or do you use aspirin and clopidogrel? The study was published in China from the China group, and in actually 500 patients were randomized, and the results were that perhaps we should begin to look at ticagrelor plus aspirin in patients undergoing cabbage. All the other trials with dual antiplatelet therapy have failed. Uh, what is your opinion? Yeah, I'm, not, I'm not so impressed with that, Val. I, th I, I think generally, generally aspirin alone, with the exception of, um, I, I am persuaded by a patient presenting with acute coronary syndromes who then undergoes bypass yeah. should have a year of dual antiplatelet therapy, as is recommended in the guidelines. Yeah. But other than that, if it's somebody who doesn't have um, kind of some other compelling reason, I probably yeah. would go with aspirin. This has, this has to be validated, and I agree. Uh, 
Second point, uh, there's a lot of talk about the arterial grafting rather than venous grafting, and the whole thing has gone from two grafts, the rima and the lima, into all sorts of grafts, you know, with all the arteries. But this is the question. It seems to me that what is really clicking is the lima and the radial artery. Why? Because if you do lima and rima, there's a lot of infection in the sternum as you try to manipulate both where the combination of radial and lima is beginning to be successful, certainly the most two recent studies from Australia. I like your opinion. I, I, I'd have to say, I think the, the, my, my, my um, sense is that having a lima to the LAD is the critical oh, factor sure. and that everything else, it probably depends on your surgeons and your center and what you're really good at and what, they're, what they feel they're most successful at. Next, uh, Annie, what do you think about the future of arterial grafting with all the pros and cons? I mean, I think the problem, um, this is different from all the drugs you, you've been talking about in that when you give a patient a drug, it's the same drug you give the patient. It comes out of a box and you give it to the patient. Surgery is different. Surgery depends on who is doing the surgery and the, the um conditions in which the surgery is being done. So you can get a different result with the same treatment, even delivered by the same surgical team on different days, and obviously by different surgical teams. And that's the problem with interpreting the data on arterial grafting, is there's so much variation due to the surgeon factor. Uh, and there's no question it's more difficult to do multiple arterial grafting than to do multiple venous grafting. And there are, no, there are no means to standardize uh, the treatment. So I, I think it's, it's very difficult. You would never get clean, clean scientific, scientific data on this subject. But there's a, there's a statement in these recent papers about this that, uh, particularly from New Zealand and Australia, and that is why, for example, in the United States, the use of two arterial grafts is done only by 15% of the surgeons. That's a key issue. Uh, and the question is why, technically, but it's the time that you have to spend doing that. So it's very concerned, to me, it's a great concern what is really happening here. Because we send patients to surgery and they come with two saphenous vein grafts and certainly the lima to the LED. Is this the way to proceed? And it's a great question in the literature at this moment. Because the radial artery, together with the lima, they are providing very good results. Anyway, I'm presenting this because these are new issues that are important and are debatable. And then the, the other issue that I want to ask, maybe Jeff, um, the patient comes with acute coronary syndrome, has a hemoglobin A1C of nine, and has a glucose of 230. How do you use insulin here? So the patient should be insulinized. Um, guidelines are still 140 to 180, although uh, in this institution, uh, oftentimes we shoot for tighter control because we can, we can do it safely. The reason 140 to 180 emerged is a lot of centers were unable to avoid hyper, hypoglycemia, but you wanna get the, the sugars down. Now, the, the theory is that early postoperative uh, morbidity is more related to the extent of hyperglycemia and less related to the diabetes condition. The diabetes condition confers the risk long term. It's that immediate uh, risk with sternal wound infections and, and some other complications in the hospital that are dependent on the hyperglycemia. So tight glycemic control first preoperatively but with cautiously sub-Q insulin yeah. and well protocol based. Um, so cautious, you know, there's a lot of latitude, yeah. but you really want protocols for yeah. this. Benjamin, this is the last question. Did you hear about the encapsulated stem cell derived beta cells to cure diabetes? Did you ever heard of this? In my research, I heard some, uh, I saw some papers that look promising, but I think that it's a, we're a little far away from, from practical use in, the, uh, in our populations. But it would certainly help a lot if we can figure out a way to, to find genetic stem cells that are identical to patients to try and cure some of these, uh, some of the ailments in this, this Jeff, situation. any comments? Uh, 
Well, thank you. Um, this is going to be the future. So regenerative medicine um, will be following. Right now, we're entering into a stage of, uh, of improved diabetes technology with um, either the bionic uh, pancreas or the artificial pancreas. But really, regenerative medicine is going to be the future uh, with stem cells and even synthetic biology. Questions, comments? <clears throat> Yes, one point why I think this is why I so much appreciate your focusing on this in this session. That and we did a um, a study in the Anthem, a large commercial, I think the fourth largest um, uh, commercial um, uh, uh, insurance company in the U.S. And we looked at the simple question of all patients who have established uh, coronary artery disease and um, type two diabetes what proportion are on these proven effective therapies? And we picked three things, um, statin, ACE or ARB, both in the recent European guidelines, 1A recommendations, and, one of, and an SGLT2 or a GLP-1 receptor agonist. And I think the number was 5%. This is yeah. insured patients in the United States. This is what we found in the Freedom trial, in the Bari trial, in the Courage trial, was between was between 10 and 15 percent. And this is actually, I forgot to mention, this is a very important comment, and that is this is why we have to treat what is around the diabetes properly. Otherwise, what we do is, is very cosmetic. It's a good point. Other comments, questions? Yes. Any comments, please? I don't know. Good question. I mean, it's a good point. There, I think there is more focus on things like, other than a simple office sitting blood pressure, at least now we're getting more into 24-hour, into patterns of blood pressure over time. But I think your points are good. Maybe even for SGLT2 inhibitors, like why are they so effective? It, there certainly is this effect on volume, and maybe we need to understand more about that. Okay, so make a final comment, uh, Chris about the subject and uh, so, so any again, that I you think, might have. Um, I, I think what we really need now to this, we've got all this information, all this data, um, and, and I think what we need as, as, a, as, a, as a group of providers taking care of patients with heart disease is an integrated approach to um, applying um, this um, evidence in a, in a systematic way. And we've totally failed at doing that, at least in the United States. We have endocrinologists who are looking at the blood sugar. We have cardiologists who are deferring to the endocrinologist on all these drugs that affect cardiovascular outcomes, and the patient is falling through the cracks. It's all over the world. I think the, one of the problems here is the cardio, cardio metabolism, whether it's lipids, whether it's diabetes, and even cerebrovascular disease, the training programs are really in deficit here. And something has to be done. We were talking about this the other day, and you're absolutely correct. But this is not only here. When you talk to uh, our friends in Europe, for example, they're facing a similar situation. There is no good training on diseases like the one that we described today in the cardiovascular field. And this is how we are recruiting endocrinologists now to really tell us what to do. Anyway, thank you very much to all of you. Thank you.